What is it that you love about flying? What I love about flying? Well, it's, uh, it's challenging. Evanston, Illinois. I'm part of the uh, uh, baby boom generation. So my freshman class had over a thousand, maybe 1,100 kids in it. And the school population at the time was, I think, 4,700 kids. I wasn't a great high school student. I loved math and I did, I excelled in mathematics. But we had a lot of fun. My parents were great parents and uh, they were followers of Christ and they displayed it in every way, in every part of their lives, and they were very generous. We always had extra people living in the house and extra people at dinner, and, and uh, they were very uh, others-oriented people, if you will. Played soccer for four years at Evanston. We were fortunate to have a soccer team, one of the few high schools in Illinois that had a soccer team at that point in the 60s. And, uh, and I wrestled for three years, my sophomore, junior, and senior year. I was, uh, wasn't really big enough to wrestle my freshman year. I only weighed 85 pounds, and the first weight class was 95. <laughs> so. By the time I got towards the end of high school, I was ready to get out of, <laughs> out of the house. I was eager to get out with life. Maybe that's one way to put it. Um, I applied to Wheaton College. I went to Wheaton College. And my main reason going there was, well, it was my parents' alma mater. It was a Christian school, and they had a good soccer team. <laughs> and I wanted to play soccer. And, they, and my older brother, who was the oldest brother, was two years ahead of me. He, he was attending Wheaton College, and uh, he was wrestling at Wheaton. And, uh, so that's the only place I really applied. That's the only place I really wanted to go. Again, I excelled in uh, mathematics. I wasn't too interested in the rest of the courses. Got interested in a young lady the summer before college started. And she was a freshman that year and became my wife by my senior year and uh, played soccer four years, wrestled for two years, and then dropped wrestling and uh, joined the hockey club during the winter. Try to keep my legs in shape for soccer. And, Played soccer for four years. Graduated in 71. We will provide all that our brave men require to do the job that must be done. And that job's going to be done. And these gallant men have our prayers, have our thanks, have our heartfelt praise, and our deepest gratitude. And let the world know that the keepers of peace will endure through every trial, and that with the full backing of their countrymen, they are going to prevail. 
It was the height of the Vietnam War, uh, all during my high school time from 63 to 67, the war in uh, Vietnam was escalating. And it was generally on the nightly news every night on TV. It was all over everything. The whole country was focused on it. You know, it was a huge deal. And uh, you couldn't miss it. It was front page every day. My brother quit school, oldest brother quit school after uh, his sophomore year and volunteered for the draft. My brother got short. What, what that means is he's ready, he's getting ready to leave Vietnam. He's got the end of his 15 months. He's been on this hill now nine months. And this helicopter came in to resupply the hill. Because he's, you know, that's how they got their food and their, you know. And my, my brother was just a couple days from being rotating out. And the first sergeant said, Elsa, get on that helicopter. My brother gets, runs to his uh, bunker, gets his duffel, packs his duffel real quick, and he bails, he goes out of the helicopter and, and goes to the main base where he was going to out-process. It took about a week for the out-process. You had to turn in all your ammunition, you had to turn in, you know, you had to go through the medical evaluation, whatever they did. Well, two nights later, the, the car overran the hill. They're bringing all the wounded. I think there's only 19 out of the 60 guys on the hill, I think only 19 survived unscathed. And uh, about over half of them were killed. But my brother found out about this because he's out processing and they're bringing all the wounded from off of his hill. And including this guy, Patrick, who had taken all these pictures of the day after and everything when, when they were leaving, I guess, when they were being rescued off the hill. I had read this book, the, the Log of the Enterprise, and I thought, well, that'd be cool. And Evanston was riding a flight path going into O'Hare, and I, you know, I'd watch the planes going around. I, thought, I always thought, man, that'd be interesting flying. I never I didn't know anything about flying. I never, I didn't know anybody that was involved in the airline industry or anything. I, I just thought it'd be interesting to fly an airplane. So I thought, well, why don't I see if I can get into naval aviation? So I went over to Glenview, uh, February of my senior year, and I took all the tests and uh, in April they called and they said, hey, we, uh, you pass all these tests, you know, we want you, we want you to come in. And I said, okay. I remember talking to the recruiter over there and I said, now listen, show me in these documents where you're gonna train me as a pilot. I knew there was such a thing as a Naval flight officer, which is the backseat person, a bombardier or a navigator or a uh, tactics coordinator who's an officer also. I want to make sure that you're, I'm not, I want to make sure you're, I'm signing up for, for flying, you know, flying an airplane. <laughs> and they said, yeah, yeah, this is, here's what it says right here, you know. That first day when I checked in down in Pensacola, <laughs> I was wearing it. it. It was common in the 70s, you know, or late 60s to wear kind of uh, fatigue shirts and, and long hair was was the hippie hair, you know, and, and of course, and so I had no idea when I showed up at the, down there in Pensacola, these Marine DIs, they did not like that one bit. You know, <laughs> came in at about 4.30 in the morning with a garbage can and a big stick in it and, and rattling around one of these metal garbage cans to wake us up. And I remember I must have jumped two feet off the bed, you know, and, and yeah, it, it was just a shock, you know, because I was in a deep sleep. And uh, and from there on, it was, you know, we, they cut our hair and they we wore what we call poopy suits, old flight suits for the first two weeks, you know, at least. 
and uh, combat boots, and we did all kinds of physical PT, they call it physical training, and you know, learned the basics of you know all kinds of stuff. It was, you know, we had ba we had ground school every day and uh, tests and and learned the basics of uh, aerodynamics and 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 uh, airplane engines and uh, procedures and so on. And then we started going up in flights with instructors. We had uh, cockpit drills on in these dummy cockpits, you know, where you have to blindfold you and find all the switches, you know. And, and uh, for the physical training, we did, uh, uh, they had a big pool, indoor pool with a, what they call the Dilbert Dunker. Had this big cockpit thing on rails up above the, like a high dive, it came down the rails, you strapped you into that. It went down in the, in the pool and flipped over upside down. And then you had to unbuckle your, your shoulder harness and seat belt and get yourself out of the cockpit and swim back to the surface. And, and we had training in, uh, we also had to swim a mile or something in the pool and tread, tread water for five minutes or something. With the hardest part was getting used to instrument flying and, and uh, getting uh, my body, you know, they, they say when in, in the Navy, when you go aboard ship, you got to get your sea legs. You got to get used to the, the motion of the ship because it makes you seasick. And, and so once you get used to that, once you acclimate to it, you, you're not seasick. Well, in aviation, you got you to get your, your flying stomach, you know, and, and so uh, the first part, the first initial uh, flights, they, they'd give us, uh, we'd go up with an instructor and they'd give a big paper bag, you know, and you sit that down between your legs in case you had to throw up, you know. I got air sick, you know. I, I, I never threw up, but I'd, I'd come back from the flights and I'd just have a tremendous headache and feel sick to my stomach. And there was 10 flights in that syllabus. And by the eighth one, I talked to my wife and said, you know, I don't think, I, I, I don't know if I can do this. I can't. You know, every time I'd, they'd come home and I'd be sick, sick as anything, you know. And, and, uh, and then, the, the, then and I made it through that syllabus and the next syllabus was formation flying. And they put, I was in the front seat, the instructor's in the back seat, you take off, you know, of course you see everything and everything's visual. And then you're practicing flying on another airplane. I loved it. It was great. It was no no sickness, no nothing, you know. But there was a program called the uh, Concurrent Master's Program in Pensacola. And if you applied for that and got accepted, you uh, stayed in Pensacola and you trained in the T2 as a jet pilot at at uh, Sherman Field, which was the main base where AOCS was. And you went half a day to flight training, and the other half a day you went to the University of West Florida and you got your master's degree in aeronautical systems. So I applied for that program, and I was accepted. So I entered that program in the, it lasted a year, and I believe we started either the summer or the fall of 72. It was a year-long master's program at the University of West Florida. So my flight training, normally the flight training took about a year to go through one of the th any of the three pipelines. Some of them were a little shorter than others. And at the end of that is when you got your wings, your Navy wings. Um, so uh, for me, because I was only doing flight training half a day and I was going to school the other half of the day, it was a two year thing. So it basically took two years from the time I came in in November 71. I didn't get my wings until 73, November 73. The day landings, if the initial ones, I don't remember too much about them because I was so nervous. But uh, eventually, you know, you get kind of used to the day landings. Uh, night landings, you never get used to. It's, there's a pretty high pucker factor on uh, night landings, nerves and everything. Are, there's a lot of adrenaline flowing. Night carrier landings are a whole different ballgame. It's all precision instrument work. Our squadron, we had a very good safety record in our squadron. We didn't lose any airplanes until after, after I left the squadron, they lost an airplane. Very unfortunate. 
and uh, lost a pilot. And our sister squadron, they, they lost one airplane on one of our cruises and uh, the, the guy punched out and he, uh, when I say punched out, he, he initiated the ejection seat and landed, you know, he got his parachute and they picked him up. And, um, and they had lost an airplane and a pilot after I left this squadron also. I realized early on that that this kind of flying was designed for young young people, not old people. I looked at my commanding officers and my executive officers who were in their 40s with kids in high school or college back home, you know, and and I thought this is a this is for young guys, not for, not for old guys. <laughs> First time I went through the, all the training and I went went out to the ship, and I had to get four night landings, decent decent passes, you know, and, and land and hook, to grab the hook. And my first couple passes were not good. I got a couple landings. Uh, I had to go around a couple times, I think. And then, and then the ship ran out of time, deck time. And so I only got two landings and I disqualified. I didn't, I didn't meet the, the minimum. So I had to go through a whole other month of night carrier landing training at the field and a whole bunch of flights and then go back to the ship again. If I'd failed that, even though I had my wings, that's it. You're 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 gonna you're, you're not gonna be a Navy carrier pilot, you know. <laughs> it's so it was a it was a wake up call. I'd done so well in everything, you know, up to that point, and I and it was a it was it was simply because I wasn't I wasn't paying enough attention to the instruments, the right. I wasn't doing the right things for the night landings, you know, which was it was totally different from the, the day landings. You know, you had to watch those instruments, and and you had to and I. I got a great instructor the second time around, and, and then it was, I, I was fine. Each air wing was assigned to two A7 squadrons. So I went to the, I went, I was assigned to an East Coast squadron, and I happened to be assigned to Air Wing 1 and VA-72. Um, it's a attack squadron 72, which was based in Cecil Field, Florida and uh, was part of Air Wing 1, which deployed aboard the USS John F. Kennedy. I was part of this squadron for three years. Um, made two uh, Mediterranean deployments. The East Coast carriers during the 70s were doing Cold War operations, showing the flag, doing NATO exercises, and um, uh, maintaining our presence in the Mediterranean. So typically uh, you fly one mission or sometimes two missions in a day or sometimes none uh, when you're at sea. And there were various missions. The fighters of course would have their mission. They would practice air combat maneuvers, you know, fighting. and and. We, we were a task, the, the squad, the A7s were tasked with a, various missions. One was search and destroy, and we would, we would go out in a sector, be assigned to a sector. And actually we did, the first cruise, we didn't have any reconnaissance airplanes with, pit, with um, cameras on them. So they give us a Topcon, you know, handheld 35 millimeter camera. And, and you know, if we saw a trawler or something or a ship to, that we, we would, would take, a, we'd get down to 500 feet and take a picture of it and uh, bring it back to the ship and turn it into the intelligence officers and they would process the film and see it. And then we had uh, practice bombing missions where a, a destroyer would uh, tow a target, like a, you'd have a thousand foot cable, they'd tow behind the destroyer, which would make this, this uh, rooster tail back there. And then we would practice bombing on that. And uh, we had little practice bombs. They were 25 pound bombs with a, like a, shotgun shell smoke cartridge in the nose that would pop so it make a puff of smoke when it hit and then you could spot how close it was to the target. How'd your wife handle those deployments when you got to associate? She was quite the trooper. We had a first son in Pensacola when I was going through the two years of training there. And, uh, <clears throat> We moved over to Jacksonville to train in the A-7, and uh, I just entered the squadron 
I'd been in a squadron just a few months, I think, and uh, our second son was born. I was out on a ship in one of these training cycles when he was born. And they went over, they flew over to uh, Italy. I think it was August or September. And they spent the next four or five months traveling around, meeting the ship at our different ports of call and followed the ship. They call them, wives that do that, they call them seagulls. And uh, my oldest son was two and the second son was four months old. And we look back on that and we're like, what were we thinking about? This was crazy, you know. I remember my dad, I think my dad asked my wife, so do you know where you're staying when you get over there? No. You know where you're gonna eat? No. But I've got this book, it says Europe on $5 a day. <laughs> What's the most important thing that we should know from being in the position? Well, like I said in the beginning, I think the military is a great experience for anybody, whether it's right out of high school or out of college. Um, there's so many opportunities to learn things, to learn skills, to learn trades, to learn about leadership, to learn. And, and the, the, the military, it's very, I have to tell you, it, it's very colorblind. It's, you know, and it's very performance-based. You know, if you, if you really knuckle down and, and do what you're supposed to do, you're gonna you're gonna get rewarded for it, and and if you if you're willing to learn, uh, there's all kinds of opportunity.